Last time out in Navarra, it was a weekend of domination for McLaren. After a 1-2 in the qualifying race, they held the front row of the grid on the run down into Turn 1. Plenty of jostling in the pack behind, but not too much movement as they were followed by the Mercedes, then the BMWs. Thomas Enger was an early casualty, he getting involved in an incident towards the back of the field. The BMW of Michael Bartels was struggling with intermittent clutch problems, causing him to spin in the early laps of the race, forcing him towards the back of the pack. Matt Halliday was on a charge in the Porsche, going past the Audi and then taking advantage of a mistake from Matteo Cressoni in the Ford GT to take up another position. The Ford GT would later retire with mechanical problems. Halliday then closed in and passed the second Audi of Oliver Jarvis to move up yet another position in a battle that would run and run. The battle over second place, though, was decided in the pit stop. The Alinkle.com Munich Motorsports Mercedes crew getting their cars turned around quicker than the Hexus McLarens, bringing them out in front in second and third places and dropping the McLaren down into a net fifth position overall. Knowing that the Mercedes didn't have the pace of the McLaren on the track, Marc Basseng was undoubtedly delighted that his team had managed to turn it around in the pit stops. The race leading McLaren came into the pits and Fred McAvicki had built up such an advantage that Steph Dusseldorf was able to regain a comfortable lead once he took over. Things were not as clear cut for the second McLaren, Alvaro Perrin having to battle hard to get past the Vita for One racing car of Nicky Mayer Melnop. And then Mike Parisi decided to try and take two cars in one corner, getting past the Ferrari, but not quite getting past Lawrence Van Thor in the second Audi. The Audi, though, would make it straight forward at the next corner, running a little bit wide, allowing the Porsche and the Ferrari to come back through. Then there was a bit of team play with Vita for One Racing. The recovering 18 car of Yama Berman getting past his teammate Nicky Mayer Melnoff. Mike Parisi spanned towards the end of the race, dropping him down a number of places. But no one could stop Steph Dusseldorf. The number one McLaren taking the victory, much to his teammate Fred McAvicki's delight, and giving the McLaren its first win in international motorsport. This moved McAvicki and Dusseldorf to the top of the championship, tied on points with the Mercedes of Nicky Passarelli and Thomas Jaeger. Aston Martin are sitting out this weekend in Slovakia in order to fully prepare their new car for the next round in the Algarve. Let's have a look at this weekend's lineup. Since dominating the opening weekend in Nagaro, the Audis haven't been back on the podium since, even though Stefano Telli and Laurence Vanthor still lie third in the championship. Behind them, Oliver Jarvis and Frank Stippler are down in seventh place, and Jarvis is cautious coming into this weekend. I think it's going to be quite a tough weekend for us here with such a long straight. We saw already in Navarra we struggled a little bit with top speed, but uh, the teams worked very hard. We've got another test session to go before qualifying. So if we keep improving, who knows, we could hopefully score some points and come away in an improved position in the championship. The Vita for One racing team have struggled to get their pace in their BMW and turn it into points. Yama Berman and Michael Bartels have been forced into a number of excellent recovery drives that are yet to taste success on the top step of the podium. Their teammates, Matthias Lauder and Nicky Van Melnhoff, are also starting to find some pace. I think we can make a good job. We have a good car. At the last race, we showed that we have good pace. We qualified so hard in the qualifying. At the first race, we had a bit of problem with the driver change, with the bell got stuck. Unfortunately, in the main race, we finished six. Our goal this weekend is to be in the top five. The season so far has been a struggle for AF Corsa, the team currently lying fifth in the Constructors' Championship. Enzo Eid, though, has experience of this circuit, winning last year in FIA GT3, and he thinks that experience is going to help him and his teammate Francesco Castellacci capitalise this weekend. I hope we'll do better than the first three rounds. We've been struggling a little bit with some weather conditions and balance of performance. Now we're in Slovakia. Me and Francesco know the track from last year's GT3 race. Um, we hope we do better uh, than the first three races, so we'll push very hard. The Ford GT encountered a resurgence in Navarra, running towards the front of the field and even attempting a challenge for the lead in the qualifying race. Amazingly, despite their pace, the Sunred team have yet to pick up a point this season, mainly due to mechanical problems, which Milos Pavlovic is confident the team can get on top of. In Navarra, the gearbox broke, but uh, the car is starting to be very quick and uh, this circuit is suiting it very well. So hopefully, you know, the team worked hard and we're going to give them the result that they all deserve. Peter Cox isn't here this weekend, so he's going to be replaced at Reiter Engineering by Stefan Racina. Racina is a Slovakian with extensive knowledge of this circuit, and in the sister car, there's the Czech driver, Thomas Enger. The two of them are hoping they can learn from each other this weekend.
This is very nice circuit. I tried it last year. Beautiful track, beautiful corners. But it's obviously Stefan Homesoils, and uh, he's uh, our new member to the team. So I'm gonna learn from him. Well, obviously, from my point of view, I don't think so because Thomas has always been my hero in GT racing. So. I'm proud to be racing in this team and in Slovakia, though, obviously, you know, if you're racing in front of your home crowd, it's something special. And if it is a world championship, that's even better. Texas McLaren have a lot to live up to this weekend after dominating the last round in Navarra. They won both the qualifying and championship races, moving Steph Dusseldorf and Fred Makovicki to joint top in the driver's standings. Philippe Dumas, the team manager, is pleased with how the team have progressed this season. It's a really good weekend in, uh, in Navarra. Uh, P1 and P2 would be better, but it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, especially I will start in Nogaro. Very, very difficult weekend, and uh, we'll continue to, to have a good reliability in, uh, in this track in Slovakia, the first time for us. So, we'll see. Despite not picking up a race win yet this season, Alinkle.com Munich Motorsports are top of the team's championship with their Mercedes-Benz SLSs. It was a great weekend for them in Navarra, a second and third position on a track they didn't expect to do well on. And Marcus Winkelhock holds a similar opinion of the Slovakia ring. We are quite, I think, fifth in the championship. Everything is really close in the moment. Um, so our main target is to score as many points as possible. I think it's not going to be easy this weekend for us because of the long straights, but uh, we will do our best. Renway is still recovering from appendicitis, so Benjamin Lariche will be joined in the number eight Porsche by Andreas Zuber. After winning the championship race in Zolder, Mike Parisi and Matt Halliday didn't pick up a single point last time out in Navarra. Halliday is hoping that that will change this time out. We had a really good race in Zolder. Unfortunately, the last round didn't really work to our plan. Mike getting pushed off at turn one the whole weekend, kind of. We struggled from there on in, but we're here, new weekend. We'll put our head down and hopefully regain some points that we lost in the last round. Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth round of the GT1 World Championship. We're here at the Slovakia ring, funnily enough, in Slovakia, and we're going to be bringing you the qualifying race today. My name is Jack Nichols. Alongside me here in the commentary box is John Watson. John, it's a lot cooler day today than we've seen over the past couple of weeks. The clouds have come in a little bit. Slight chance of rain. Hopefully that won't come, but uh, this Slovakia ring, a great circuit. It's a very, very good circuit indeed, 5.9 kilometers, 14 corners, plus, for the first time, a temporary chicane, which is on the exit of turn two, on the run down to what I would call the fluke flats. It's one of the bridges, there are three of them around the racetrack, and it's an area of the circuit where there was concern that cars may get airborne. This is the fourth round of the championship, as you can see, we go to the Algarve in a couple of weeks' time before heading off to the flyaways, China, Russia at the end of September, and then India at the start of December, rounding off this season. And it's, uh, as, we, as we've said, the, the circuit, we're about to get a look at it here. And you'll notice when we see the graphic, the long sweeping corners that really characterize this place. Compare it to Zolder uh, or Nagaro, the early places we went, they were very tight and technical. This is a lot quicker. Yes, it is. And a lot of these corners are much more open. They're long corners, especially in that end of sector one. Turn two is a long, open right-hand corner exits then just about 150 meters before the chicane before you have that run rise over the bridge it's a good combination drivers like the circuit it's wide there's every opportunity for really exciting motor racing here this afternoon and fred makovicki and steph dusseldorf put the car on pole position and they are currently joint lead in the drivers championship as well there you can see the chicane uh, made out of the tires Oh, interesting, that chicane, normally you think of them as being second gear. I spoke to Steph Dusseldorf, the co-driver of Fred Makovicki. That car is on pole position. I said, Steph, what gear are you using going through there? Not what gear are you wearing, what gear are you using? And he said, uh, third. But he did say that Fred Makovicki was using fourth gear out of a six-speed gearbox. That's a quick right-left corner. The two of them are currently joint top of the championship as well, along with Thomas Jaeger and Nicky Pastorelli. You can also see on 46 points, Makovicki and Dusseldorf at the top because they have a race win, whereas Jaeger and Pastorelli don't. Stefano Telli and Laurence Vanthor lie third in the championship. Bartels and Berman in the BMW are in fourth. Mark Rassing and Marcus Winkelhock in fifth. Matt Halliday and Mike Parisi in sixth position. We have had different winners in every single championship race so far. 
uh, and every single qualifying race as well, independently. There you can see the team's championship. Al Inkle, despite not winning any of those races that I've just mentioned, are top of the team's championship. 85 points ahead of Hexis and then Belgian Audi Club. Speedborne Racing Team, AF Corsa, Exim Bank Team China, Writer Engineering. Incredibly, uh, the Ford GT uh, team of Sunred are yet to pick up a point this season, which is very impressive. Let's hear then from Matteo Cressoni. He's in that Ford GT. They're down at the back of the grid, and he is with Hayley Coxon, who's our lady on the grid. Matteo, despite starting from the back of the grid, you are on the pace here this weekend, so hopefully you're going to finish in a good position. Yeah, we hope. Uh, we, we, we would like to show our potential in any case, and uh, we did, uh, me and Milos, a really good job, and uh, we hope for race to do again another nice job. Thank you. Yep, Matteo Cressoni in that Ford GT. They qualified that car third on the grid, but due to a technical infringement, they now have to start uh, down the back of the field. Alongside them at the back of the pack will be Matt Halliday and Mike Parisi, who qualified 11th, but Mike Parisi crashed the car on the exit of turn nine in qualifying, and uh, as a result, they have uh, had to take it out of the... Um, it had to take it out of Park Ferme, that's the word I'm looking for. The other Porsche was also in trouble. That oil you can see there was laid down by the number eight Porsche of Andreas Zuber, we believe. And as a result, the marshals have had to work hard and are still working hard putting down the cement dust to tidy up all that uh, dust. And this was uh, earlier on. You can see the number eight car made it back to the grid, Andreas Zuber, but then they had to push it off into the pit lane to uh, to try and fix the problem. Yeah, not least of all fix the problem, but put oil into the engine because the car has poured oil pretty much all the entire duration of the racetrack. So that car is going to be extremely low on oil. The marshals, you can see, are still working around the racetrack to absorb that with speedy dryer, in this case, probably cement dust. So that's going to be an issue for the drivers on the opening lap of this race. The other issue, which you did allude to about the chicane in to turn one, there is a suggestion, we're waiting just for confirmation, that there will be a yellow flag zone from the exit of turn two down to that chicane. Therefore, no overtaking is allowed. Now, the drivers in their briefing were concerned because at the start of a race, as opposed to when the race is in its normal flow, there's the possibility of two cars coming through turn two close either side by side or in a passing position and they wanted clarification of what would happen. I just spoke to the race director as he was going out to inspect the circuit just before we came in. On the first lap the yellow flags will go out before turn two so there will be no side by side action into turn two. You can race through turn one, sort yourselves out before turn two and then it's yellow flags through the chicane then it's clear. For the rest of the race it will just be yellow flags at the chicane. Let's hear from Benjamin Lariche. His Porsche spilt this oil. Benjamin, there's some dramas with the Porsche just even before the cars have gone out. Can you explain what's happened? Yeah, and the um, uh, listen a little um, a big noise on the entry of the grid. So uh, I don't know what is the problem. I think uh, we had a problem with the oil. So uh, the repairs and uh, we hope uh, we expected uh, to, to be at time to, to, to start the race. Could be good news and uh, we'll see. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so the, them delaying the start has, has, has effectively given them time to fix the oil problem as well. There you can see Mike Parisi on the right-hand side. He's uh, just waiting. Darrell Young there in the 25 car. He's going to feel a bit aggrieved because him and Stefan Racina had a very quick pace, but Darrell Young lost the rear bumper in qualifying. They had to come into the pits and fix it. Didn't give them enough time to go back out. So Darrell Young will uh, actually start... Uh, down there in 12th position on the grid. The other thing that came out of the driver briefing, just to go back to what's, what we're going to see at the start of this race, if you reflect back a fortnight at the start of the qualifying race, in particular in Navarra, where the 4GT of Pavlovich and Krasuni had an absolute flyer and they weren't the only ones, the grid formation now stipulates that no car can be more than half a car width outside its designated starting box and that's going to be closely monitored and anybody that does will get a penalty. Here's the alinkle.com Munich Motorsports Mercedes. They struggled in qualifying in their 500 brake horsepower V8 Mercedes SLS and uh, it was a real shame for them because this car is currently leading the championship both joint in the drivers championship and outright 
in the team's championship and it really is an impressive piece of machinery. I mean, we've been lucky enough to have a few goes in the course car, which is a, a, the road going version with a few tweaks here and there of the Mercedes SLS, but it's gonna be 10th on the grid for the number 37 car and 9th on the grid for there, the number 38 car, which is gonna be started by Marcus Winkelhock. You can see Winkelhock's helmet in there, but he himself is can't quite see him. Where is he? Lurking around here somewhere. There's Mark Basseng and Thomas Jaeger and Nicky Pastorelli. So maybe Marcus Winkelhock has dashed off for one of those infamous uh, reliefs before the uh, before the start of a race. But the Al Inkle, the Mercedes were always going to struggle here because straight line speed isn't their thing. And there's a lot of flat out straights here. Yes, and of course every team is always juggling for a advantage. Some teams have been given small alterations. For example, the pole sitting car. They, the drivers came in this morning to find out that they had a small amount of the boost. And this is one of the few cars that runs a turbocharged engine, if not the only one that runs a turbocharged engine. A small amount of the boost has been taken away from the McLaren MP4 12Cs. And that makes, I think, the performance that we have seen from the number one car all the more credible because it's not just horsepower they lose, it's torque, and torque is such a valuable part of an engine's performance and the way it enables a car to drive through and off a corner. So they're, they're not happy about it, but some of the other competitors are. There's Lawrence Van Thorpe just chilling by his number 32 Audi. He's gonna be starting this race seventh on the grid, and uh, the Audis performed a little better in qualifying, but it was his teammate Stefan Ortelli who after I think going third in the second qualifying segment threw it off the road dramatically up at turn nine there's our little car that, that indeed is the car that we use this is the described leading car the SLS Mercedes-Benz let's hear from Matthias Lauda and Nicky Mermanoff they're down in the pit lane they're going to be starting eighth on the grid Matthias you're definitely getting stronger will we we'll be seeing team Austria on the podium today Oh, today, I don't know. The, today, the race is not so important. It's just a qualifying race. If you'll be in the podium tomorrow, it will be better. And Nicky, how do you feel the BMW is performing here? Um, really well. We saw the pace from Yelma in the qualifying. Very impressive. I had a little mistake in the qualifying, so uh, we're a little bit further in, back in the field, but the field is a little small, so I think it's going to be very important in the first few corners with the chicane, looking forward to, and also the oil all around the track now. Um, but we'll be fighting for top five, top four maybe today, and on the podium tomorrow, where the important points are up for grabs. Thank you. You may remember back in Navarro we saw very frustrated, very angry Nicholas Meyer Manhoff at the driver change when Matthias Lauda got into the car kicking him and he could have paid for the Austrian football team. <laughs> but the problem was, and look at the, there you can see not only skid marks, those are from the drifters are here, part yeah. of the show that's going on. A lot of oil has gone down on the racetrack but just to go back to the problem that that car suffered when Matthias Lauda got into it, for some reason the seat belt got twisted and he couldn't get it done. And it was the frustration of, of, my, of Nicholas Meyer Meinhoff of trying to communicate to Matthias Lauda, and that's why it all occurred. I mean, it's all a bit pantomime now, yeah. but at the time it really looked like you know, a very mild mannered Austrian racing driver was, had completely lost the plot. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, Enzo Ede on the left, Francesco Castellacci with a bit of hay fever on the right, and uh, that number four Ferrari will be starting in fifth place. Ferrari have found a bit of pace this weekend, which is great to see. Fourth and fifth on the grid for the AF Corsa squad. There's some of the fans here at the Slovakia ring. We're about uh, 40 kilometers southeast of uh, Budapest. And uh, we've got the 10 minute board will go up at 10 to two. And the safety car will start at two o'clock. So there will be, so, okay. So there's gonna be no formation lap. The safety car start will start the race by the sounds of things because if we've had this delay they decided that when the cars leave the grid it will be behind the safety car safety car will peel in and i think single file start will 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 occur and oh, that's going to be interesting because again it, it has a bearing on what would happen down on the exit of turn two so it probably makes around the issue yeah. that. but again there's a lot of cement dust around the racetrack it may cause visibility problems for the cars and drivers that are further back in the field. So lots of things that are being thought about and coming up with solutions. They're not ideal always, but uh, under the circumstances, these are the ones that they've, just, they've chosen. There's a lot of Jarvis Wonder talking man. about his weekend last weekend and his upcoming weekend this weekend. And in between, he's got a busy weekend here at the Slovakia ring. Yep. 
He does indeed. He's off to Le Mans, of course, in a couple of days' time. Well, possibly even Monday, as soon as this Sunday race is night. finished. Sunday night, really. Crikey. Let's hear from Philippe Salacuado. We were talking about how strong the air, of course, of Ferraris are this weekend. He's going to start fourth on the grid. Philippe started from the second row. It's looking hopeful that you'll be walking away with some more points today. Yeah, we started uh, the first part of the, the weekend. We started quite well. We qualified five. Now we move up to fourth because the fourth. Uh, hopefully we can we can score some points in the first race. Uh, I'm looking really forward to start from P4. Hopefully we can get the podium. Thank you. OK, there's Philippe Salacuada, as I say, fourth on the grid. And, uh, well, it will be Tony Belanda starting the car. The fin is already strapped in and ready to go, keeping it cool in there. And, uh, well, if he was a proper fin like Raikkonen, he'd be ho off having a chalk ice or something, wouldn't he? But Belanda, ever the professional, and uh, you don't get more professional race drivers than Tony Belanda. He's been racing Ferraris for years, and he has stuck that car fourth on the grid. And just Philippe Salacuada's views about looking forward to a good race, maybe getting on the podium. But of course, the benefit that they've got is they've qualified on the second row of the grid. And it is so much easier in the opening laps to consolidate that position rather than starting three or four rows back and then trying to battle your way through. What happens in the first two or three laps usually is key to the outcome of an event. Absolutely. And it is this car that has had to battle its way through an unfortunate amount of times really in the past couple of races uh, fuel problems I think it was on the way to the grid in the first race in Navarra then intermittent clutch problems sent them to the back again and so Michael Bartels who will be starting the Vita for One racing team BMW Z4 will be hoping that everything will go a little bit more straightforward and he can start the front run at the front yeah it'll be an interesting drag race from the start finish straight down to turn one between the BMW and the McLaren Bearing in mind that McLaren has had a little bit of horsepower and a bit of torque taken away from it. There is the pole position car. It's on the right-hand side of the track going down into turn one. So it is in the position to defend the entry to the corner. But of course, by the time you get there, we've now been advised that they can't do anything between turn one and turn two. So what they achieve into turn one is what they're going to have to maintain until they exit the chicane before they get down to turn three. Yep, so there is the pole sitting car. It's going to be started by Steph Dusseldorf, who had such a fantastic opening stint in Navarra in the qualifying race when he started the car, moving from uh, the back of the grid all the way up into second position. By the time the pit stops came around, you can see there that the oil is pretty much sorted. And let's hear from Fred Makovicki. He is the pole sitter alongside Steph Dusseldorf, and Fred is with Haley. Fred, are you going to be pushing hard from the start or are you going to hold back a little bit? Yeah, it shows that uh, it's really better to start on, on the front. Uh, just now, be careful with, with the oil on the track after the problem of the Porsche. And uh, we hope so that uh, we can do a safe race and uh, absolutely finish today because uh, tomorrow is another day and it's, impo it's important for us to take point. Thank you. So I think it will be interesting to see what cars decide to do on the formation lap, whether they try and intentionally run through the oil to, uh, to try and get some of the cement dust away and kind of clear it up a little bit or whether they'll avoid it and then the race will start and it'll be like a scene in James Bond when well, you deploy the, the, the dust yeah, the, behind you. The, the biggest trouble is if you run through the cement to try and clear it, what you're going to do is clear it straight onto your tyres. Yeah. So therefore you're going to lose grip and it's, you know, they're going to run through it, wherever it is it's going to be run through. But I don't think anybody would deliberately run through it because the tyre temperature, the cars have been sitting in the grid now for the best part of what, 25 minutes if not longer and whatever tyre temperature they've generated, it's all gone. So everybody's going to be in a situation. Look, at, look how wide the racetrack is. Just, just suddenly it appears in that picture. You've never seen a gap between the front row starting grid of two cars. It's almost the length of a cricket pitch between them. So there you can see the start delayed due to oil on the track. And it will be at 2 o'clock and it will be a safety car start. So the cars will head off on their formation lap as usual. But the formation lap will also be the rolling up lap and then the safety car will pull into the pits and we believe it will be a single file safety car start so the McLaren ahead of the BMW blah 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 so you have to wait until you cross the line to make an overtaking maneuver so as if the safety car had come out midway through the race the grid then is starting to be cleared it's the McLaren and the BMW on the front row of the grid we haven't really mentioned Oliver Jarvis we spoke to him earlier and we said he's going to Le Mans but Audi back on form for the first time since Nagaro really they're they're really up there and on the pace yes I mean each racetrack 
produces a different set of circumstances. Some circuits will suit one manufacturer or two or three manufacturers, others will not. And it's just ebbs and flows. Here's a look at the grid then. It's the McLaren and the BMW on the front row, then the Audi and the Ferrari on the second row of the grid. The second Ferrari is in there alongside the second McLaren. So a good weekend for Ferrari and McLaren. Audi, BMW once again on position seven and eight. Then we've got the first of the Mercedes, Thomas Enger. Watch out for him. I think he's going to be uh, pretty quick, although actually it's going to be Albert von Turnen Taxis starting that car, isn't it? Two Porsches of Zuba and Parisi. I'm not sure Zuba will be on the grid. He may have to make a pit lane start. And Matteo Cressoni will start the Ford GT from the very rear of the field. We're being told the safety car will be out for at least two laps. So... I wonder if when the safety car starts, the clock will start. I, would, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen. But again, we'll wait for confirmation. Rain. Is, rain. I will be, we had a little bit of rain, a very small light tinkling of rain, oh, about an hour and a half, two hours ago. But those clouds have been gradually, gradually, but they're very high. It's not as if the cloud base is very low. It's a high cloud base. So hopefully, whatever is falling, it may just be in one part of the racetrack. It doesn't appear on the pit straight where we're looking out of our commentary position from that there's any rain here, but uh, it is falling elsewhere. No, it'd be interesting to know where that uh, camera position was that picked up that rain because it doesn't look as though there's any rain on the actual start finish straight. All the cars are unsurprisingly slick shod. And there is Steph Dusseldorp getting ready. And, and, and you got a, a very brief glimpse of the full carbon monocell which is the, the construction of the McLaren. It's the only car that has a full car. Now you can see, and that is technology right at the leading edge of carbon fiber because it is made as an injection molded carbon fiber tub, very sophisticated. Other manufacturers are now using that technology to produce their own version of what McLaren have pioneered. Michael Bartels will be alongside that McLaren on the front row. And he is currently lying fourth in the championship. They won that they didn't, they picked up one point in Nagaro then had a first and a second in Zolder, which was a better weekend for them, and then a third and a fifth in Navarra. So if it wasn't for that poor, difficult Nagaro weekend, they'd be on it. We're on board with Lawrence Van Thor as he waits to get ready. And uh, just a bit of muck on the screen to get rid of. But Lawrence tightens his belts, and you can see all the switches down on the right-hand side. They, there's a lot they can do inside this car, but the drivers tell me that that really it's not like Formula One where you see all the switches, drivers changing them all the time, corner to corner, brake bias adjustments down in the cockpit. With the GT cars, you set them up and you race. Well, the one change you've got, you've got an adjustable uh, traction control. Mm. And that's something that drivers may want to play with, particularly as the tyre wear or tyre, the level of grip varies. So again, one car may struggle with a rear tyre wear problem. Maybe they may get the tyre a little bit warmer than is suitable for the tyre's optimum performance. So those are some of the things they can adjust. But this is a road-going formula. These cars are cars that you can go into the showroom, be it a Ferrari or a Porsche, Mercedes-Benz. You can buy a car that is not a million miles away from what we're going to watch now. I probably couldn't, but there are some people out there. There well, are some people out I mean, there. I've seen in the paddock 458 Ferraris, Porsches, Ford yep. Mustangs, McLaren, I saw a white MP412C, Slovakian plates. Yep. That's got to be a first. Yeah. Quite possibly. And a Lamborghini as well. Lovely. Just they to complete. Love, they love their Lambos and Bratislava. Just to complete our brand lineup, there is the BMW then. And uh, we've got one minute to go. The one minute board is hoisted aloft, and these Slovakian fans that have turned out here to the Slovakia ring. It is a wide circuit, isn't it? It is enormous. I mean, yeah. I, I never appreciated it until you see the grid. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, that's, it's got to be what the best part it's of. It's like Sepang, isn't it? Well, it's. it's, it's Certainly it's 90 feet, probably just under, about 26, 27 metres wide. So, there would be plenty of room off the start, but as we say, it's going to be a safety car start, and uh, that will help to clear up some of the oil, I think is basically the plan. Clear up the oil, and Fred Makovicki watching on, looking a little bit nervous, Pen pensive, pensive, yeah. Pensive. None of that smile that, uh, that he usually has. Mr. Colgate. Mr. Colgate, yeah. And there you can see the grid. Uh, well, it's going to be a little bit of an anticlimactic uh, race actual start as they head off behind the safety car. Green flag wave from the back of the field. The, uh, the marshals want it to get on, don't they? And they're holding up the safety car board. So the clock does start now then. So we will have a couple of laps behind the safety car, at least two apparently, and then the race will get underway. So 
not the start we wanted to see, but of course, they are forced into these positions by the track conditions, and the track conditions have come due to that number eight Porsche you can see in the pit lane there. That'll, uh, it's good news for it, really, because it might be allowed to leave now and uh, then be able to join the back of the pack if he can slot in behind the leading car, but the cars go away, and Matt Halliday is putting his suit on, just in case, just to get ready. So yeah, we're going to have a couple of laps behind the safety car, and this will give us a good view of the uh, of the circuit. Looks like they might still be working on that Porsche, actually, up there. Well, I, I would have assumed that the car would have followed the tail of the, the crocodile, as, as it's called, uh, immediately had gone past pit lane exit. Now, maybe they are still working on it, as you say, but strange not to see it uh, catching up to the very back as the cars come out of turn two down to this chicane. This is a quick chicane. Drivers have been very well behaved all through the two days of running here. Nobody, to my knowledge, has clipped it, and uh, it's nice to see that the chicane has been made sufficiently open to make it a challenge rather than a stop, turn, turn, go type one we normally get. Well, you could see on that previous shot there was a, a, a yellow piece of chalk there. Um, that chalk loop was where it was, and it was a very much a stop chicane, but happily, SRO, FIA, everybody saw sense made it a little bit more expansive and as a result it does the job of slowing the cars down before the jump Look and whoa, my whoa. goodness i mean that is horrendous that is that is uh, a lot of the cement dust down Gosh, there isn't it if i was deaf Dusseldorf, i would get oh i wouldn't even be looking at it let anybody else who's mad enough to drive through it drive through it but that is going to be an absolute nightmare to clean off your tires yeah, well, I, 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 they've probably been instructed to run through it as much as possible, I yeah, would I mean, suggest. Well, but because somebody instructs you, does that mean you're going to do it? <laughs> That's something you do at school, not when you're a man. So this is looking back, I believe, from the 38 car of um, Mark Basseng. And uh, you can see he is hitting the accelerator, then the brakes. See, around here, it's not too bad because he's not on the racing line. I imagine that uh, Andreas Zuber didn't realize initially what was happening as soon as he did pulled off the racing line this is out the far uh, end of the circuit now there's Thomas Enger watching on so his car is going to be started by Albert von Turn and Taxis and it this is the up, up out of turn nine this is where you saw two incidents one with that Porsche of Mac Parisi and Mike Halliday and there is the number eight Andrea Zuber car now leaving the pit lane and he's got the benefit of being able to run much more quickly than yeah. the cars following the safety car. And the benefit of that is he's going to get a little bit more, in theory, he's going to get a little bit more heat into the tyres on that particular Porsche than the rest of the field that's running at the pace of the safety car. I wonder if he will have the pace to catch up with the pack, though, before the race gets underway. That'll well, be the interesting thing. Going to be, we're going to have, we believe, two safety car laps. So if he can't catch up to the tail of this crocodile, he shouldn't be in the car. <laughs> Andreas Zuba holds the lap record here in 2010. He competed in the Euroboss series, driving a Dallara GP2 car, and so he holds the lap record. A one minute, I uh, can't remember, a one minute 44.210, I think it was, off the top of my head, in the GP2 car. Some 20 seconds quicker than these uh, FIA GT1 cars are lapping. And remember, of the, Andreas Zuba didn't have a chicane on the exit of turn two. So true. you can say the chicane would probably add minimally three seconds per lap it is a quick chicane but nonetheless you've got a break turn turn and then accelerate yeah and that speed you lose and well it's not looking like it's worked out very well for uh, andres zuba hopefully he's not dropping more oil down on the well, circuit yeah, but, there uh, it was you would see it but in fact looking at the it's hard just to judge on the camera is that all gushing out of the rear of the car again or not i'm not sure but doesn't look like it's going to be a good day for the number eight porsche safety car is uh, still out there as we wait for this race to get underway Benjamin LaRiche well I don't know if he uh, well a puff out of the cheeks obviously very disappointed with how things have transpired for him this weekend him and Dino Lenardi had a stronger weekend last time out in Navarra but they're still waiting to pick up points this season is uh, Benjamin LaRiche He's had a best of a 14th in the opening round in Nagaro. So the young Frenchman who raced in FIA Formula 2 last year has struggled a little bit this season with his teammate Renway, then Dino Lenardi, and now him and Andreas Zuba are having a difficult weekend. But this, you can see yeah. in the second of those two McLarens, 
whether he and made it a move to get off it, but once he was on the cement, there's zero grip. And that's well on the racing line as well, isn't it? There's no avoiding that. This is through the, that's through the left-hand kink at turn four. Then they come through the long right-hander at five, and then which tightens subsequently into six, and then it doubles back on itself through seven, eight, and nine. So, so the, the, the brilliant, it's the end almost of the, the first intermediate sector, and all the way through to the end of the second intermediate sector. So it's the entire, what you might describe as the infield of what we, is a perimeter race. Like there is the Porsche stopped. Oh. And Andreas River climbing out of it now. Whereabouts on the racetrack? We need a wide angle to get a view of where that is. He certainly appears to be off the racing track because those yeah. there's a variety of options that can be used here in the Slovakia ring. It's down at turn uh, 10. I think he's parked that on the inside of turn 1. Yelma Berman uh, being attacked somewhat by uh, Matthias Lauda. So hopefully that Porsche is far enough out of the way. You know for the, it not to cause a problem. The, 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 I think the corner that's going to be the biggest problem, a problem corner, is going to be turn nine because as the car exit turn nine, that's where all that cement and dust is, and that's one of the corners that we saw the two incidents that we had watched this morning. And uh, well, disappointment indeed for the Exxon Team Bank China car sitting there, and uh, well, old Thomas the Tank Enga, he has hit a few thoughts he shared with me today as well. Disappointed that they didn't get further up the grid. They're on the fifth row, and uh, the pace was in that car. And Albert, very honestly, we did mention this in the, in the qualifying report, put his hand up and said, "I made an error, and the car should be further up." There was an opportunity, a, a consideration that Stefan Rosina might actually share with Thomas Enger the car, the 24 car, but because of the, the situation within the team and. The decision factor, we're going to another lap now as well, that uh, it was decided to keep the Enger von Tunen Taxis partnership as it is and, and let Rosina drive alongside Daryl O'Hare, Young. Let's hear from bon Bernard Molner. He is the boss of the Team Porsche squad and he's with Hayley Coxon. Bernard, what's happening with the Porsche? Uh, car number eight had this problem in the qualifying when it was in the gravel and followed to this there was an oil leakage. And in the introduction laps, this oil leakage made the car losing oil. And so the car came in, we fixed the leak, but now we have a noise in the car, and so we decided to stop to not blow up the engine. Thank you. Well, normally when an oil, or when a noise appears, I mean, a driver wearing a helmet, or earplugs with a radio attached to it, and all the other bits and pieces, um, when you hear a noise, normally it means it's too late because something has actually in the process of failing and normally you're looking at bearings possibly pistons um, and usually with a very large euro sum of money attached to the problem Milos Pavlovic probably wanting this race to get underway there is Andreas Zuba who is um, looking forward to this race because he didn't get to go out in qualifying because Benjamin Norish didn't make it through the first segment after a little spin it sounds I don't know if uh, something was lost in translation there, but it sounded to me as though Mulner was suggesting the oil leak caused Benjamin Larish's spin in qualifying. Maybe I've misinterpreted what Bernard said there, but uh, nevertheless, Andreas Zuber yet to drive this car in anger in a qualifying or race session. He'll have to wait for his second stint tomorrow if they can get that car I mean, fixed I think in it's, time. I think it's as simple as remove the engine and then replace it with another one. Simple. I'm assuming that they've got a spare motor with them because uh, if oil is lost in the volumes that we can see here on circuit and they topped it back up again and it's still not doing the business, then that engine will have to be taken out. So 50 minutes in this race remaining, hopefully before too long, the safety car will come in and the race will be underway proper. There will be stationary yellows at that chicane for the uh, entirety of the race in the same way that it operates at the hairpin at, at Macau. The other thing, it's only going to be about 15 minutes before the pit yeah. lane opens. Yeah, that's going to be something to consider because, well, some of these drivers have their, in inverted commas, quickest drivers out first, some have them out second. So that's going to be very interesting to see as well. And uh, number 38 can overtake car 24. So Mark Basseng has been given permission to overtake Albert von Turn and Taxis. Um, and I think that is because Albert von Turn and Taxis has for some reason ended up ahead of Mark Basseng on the circuit. They uh, 
they are in their wrong grid order. I think if you look up here, there's the... Well, he's gone past now, so Mark Basseng is now ahead of that first rider engineering Lamborghini, so the switch has been made. Safety car stays out another lap. It's on to its fourth lap. Yep, currently leading the race. 1.4 seconds clear of Steph Dusseldorp, but uh, the Apollis are going up as well. I was going to say, did you notice quickly there, that shot of the crowd, the Apollis are going up so clearly, and we're now getting rain on the windows here on the commentary booth, so the wind and the rain picking up, and the rain is falling, so uh, it is a real nightmare to get this race underway on a track that is very heavily lubricated in oil, covered in, in uh, cement dust, on cars that are on cool, slick tyres. There are rain tyres being prepared. The rain has not made the racetrack wet or anywhere like it, but it's indicative, and it looks like it's here for certainly the next five or so minutes. The window, looking through it, is getting more and more rain on it. Yep, it's fairly light rain, though, as we say. It has been declared a wet race, so the teams are now more than welcome to come into the pits and change for wet tyres. None of them will be doing that uh, just yet as the safety car period continues. Hopefully, as soon as that Porsche is recovered, it may even be recovered from the inside of Turn 1, this race will get underway proper because we've still got a great battle, I think, to ensue because, well, that's a reasonable amount of moisture. It's always going to look quicker when you're travelling at... It's always going to look heavier rain when you're travelling at 200 kilometres an hour or so, isn't it? Yes, I mean, the circuit itself isn't showing any indication of spray coming off it, but immediately a driver sees rain on his windscreen, he is cautious, he will know that his tyres are cool, if not cold. So the wet race has been declared, and, well, hopefully that... Um, hopefully the cement dust has done a good enough job of soaking up the oil, because oil well, and well, moisture... Why, on why would it? I mean, you're going to have an amalgam of oil, cement dust, and now water. And, I mean, you mix those three in a bottle, in a glass, try and stand on it, it's impossible. <laughs> I've never done that. And, and you know, normally the shoes that we wear have got treads on them. These are treadless tyres at the minute. And whether anybody will take the option of coming in, it says cars must have their lights on. That's another... All the cars have now, just as you see them going over the, the crest, yeah, uh, have got their lights on, except I think the Ford, I'm not sure whether that's the lights a, That's Ford. a requirement when it is declared a wet race, the lights must come on so the rain is coming down here at Slovakia we're still behind the safety car after a oil leak and oil leak on the formation lap meant that the track workers had to put lots of cement dust down and as a result it was decided to start the race behind the safety car and the lights are still on as they go down the back straight so we will get at least one more lap the Audi team pointing to the sky. Oh, look, yeah, you can see. I mean, the meteorologist amongst us are going to say, well, it's going to get wetter before it's going to get drier. And that's what Pierre Dudone, who runs the Audi team, is discussing with his guys. What do we do? Do we make the stop or do we stay out and roll the dice? That what? it may clear. Because the cloud base is so high, I think some of them are going to roll the dice. Yeah, well, let's not forget tyre choices for Audi didn't exactly go to plan in Zolder, did they? They had an absolutely torrid weekend of tactical tyre decisions, so there's probably a little bit of nervousness there, as we watch from the inside of Turn 1, I think that is, and that suggests that the Porsche has been cleared. Yes, you can just see it in between the Armco barriers, but there's only 10 minutes till the pit stop window opens, so I would suggest no one's going to come in now, well, the yellow because, flag looks like it's being withdrawn. Yeah, but no one will come in because they'll try and stay out for the 10 minutes so they can and, make and, their pit stop. To me, at the minute, the benefits, of the, first of all, the loss of time coming in to change onto a set of wet tyres, which in these conditions are not designed to operate in. The racetrack isn't wet. We've had moisture, rain falling, but the circuit is not yeah. a wet circuit. It's just that the race has been declared a wet race because of those are the regulations that, that, that everybody runs under. Absolutely. On board we go with Lawrence Van Thorpe. Safety car in at the end of this lap then, so the race is about to get underway. And not a moment too soon, really, because it's uh, always frustrating to watch a safety car start. If any of you tuned in to watch the Blancpain Endurance Series, you'll be used to them. 
and no less than 10 minutes before the mandatory pit stop pit lane window is open. Yeah, absolutely, so the drivers now will be working hard to get heat into their Pirelli tyres. Fred Makovicki, Philippe Dumas, probably about to make his way over to the pit wall, I'd imagine. And, uh, or actually, they might not technically be allowed on the pit wall because you can't be on it at the start of a race, even though Safety Car has started the race technically. There's all sorts of regulations uh, as Stefan Ortelli and Frank Stippler watch on. This race will be contested in effect then over about 43 minutes, really. And so once the race gets underway, there will only be eight minutes until the pit stop window opens. On board with Van Thorpe, trying to get as much heat in those tyres as possible. Down into the left-hander at turn 10 he comes. A long, long left-hander, then a little kink right, you can see there, that's turn 11. And then another kink left, which is turn 12. Lights off on the safety car, so it'll now be Fred Makovicki's job to margin the gap. Uh, sorry, Steph Dusseldorf's job in that number one car to decide on the gap. This might be the first safety car we've had this season, actually, in GT1. But nevertheless, Fred Makovicki will watch his teammate. Steph Dusseldorf backs the pack up. We're finally about to get racing underway here at the Slovakia rink. An elongated safety car period is now over. The lights are off on the safety car. It has pulled into the pits. It's the McLaren of Dusseldorf leading. The BMW of Michael Bartels in second. Oliver Jarvis is third in the Audi. Fourth is the Ferrari of Tony Volander. Dusseldorf waits to stamp on the throttle pedal. He's waited a long time. When's he going to go? He's still waiting for it. Now he goes. He bolts. Bartels follows him. Then comes the Audi. The two Ferraris are pretty close to one another as well. But that's worked out pretty well for Dusseldorf. He crosses the line with a four-tenth of a second advantage. Bartels doesn't feel comfortable to move to the outside of the circuit. Here comes Tony Volander to the outside. It's three abreast for second place. Volander's going to go around the outside of both of them, is he? That's going to be an incredible move if he can pull it off. Tony Volander finds himself in second place in the Ferrari. That was absolutely phenomenal from Volander into turn two they come battles further back now the yellow flag zone is in place and they will have to tiptoe their way through the chicane what a move from Volander yeah it's a good strong move and look how much he's run down the tail of Steph Dusseldorf in the McLaren and the whole field almost is closed back up the advantage of Dusseldorf opened up on that initial run and, and Volander up the inside can he make it to the lead he can Tony Volander takes the lead of the race very forcefully up the inside of Steph Dusseldorf that air of course of Ferrari very strong. Now we're into the dusty section of the circuit. The windscreen wipers are on, but Tony Volander has confidence in his car that no one else seems to have at the present time. And he has taken the lead of the race after starting fourth on the grid. Van Thor sends it to the outside. He's going towards the gravel trap. Can he keep it out of it? He can just about, but he's going to lose a large amount of positions. So let's uh, take a breath here coming towards turn nine is Tony Volander leading Dusseldorf second it's the Audi in third place with Michael Bartels right up behind him fourth as they dive into all this cement dust and it's a good start from a poor start actually from uh, Thomas Jaeger he, Nicky Pastorelli sorry he has dropped down a little bit Basseng is battling with the BMW yeah he's got made a good pass coming down the hill so that into turn nine and ten and uh, what a great start from Tony Volander he used his what the Ferrari had, which was grip and confidence of the driver. Now you can see up over the top, down through turns 11 into turn 12, and the Ferrari has got the best part of what over maybe two seconds of advantage. And uh, now the second of the Ferrari looks down the inside of the BMW, but not able to get it done. Not close enough there. That's Francesco Castellacci starting that second AF course of Ferrari. But out of the final corner comes Tony Volanda then to cross the line after our first racing lap. There's his teammate, Philippe Salacuada, looking satisfied. But Volanda leads, Dusseldorf second in the McLaren, Jarvis third. Fourth is Berman, uh, sorry, Bartels, but he's coming under a lot of pressure from Castellacci. Castellacci looking to the outside under braking, and he's gone around the outside oh, of turn one. Oh, he can't yeah. stop it. Into the gravel goes Francesco Castellacci. AF Corsa team, heads in hands, and he's going to drop right to the back of the field. He performed strongly here last year in FIA GT3. Bit too ambitious this time. Yeah, he, he made a move. It was a good move. Unfortunately, he couldn't make the move stick. The outside of the corner, less grip. There he gets the car back onto the racetrack. But he's gone all the way from fifth place to the tail of the field. So, through the little chicane they come, 
And it looks as though Mike Parisi has made up a number of places as well, actually. He started right at the back of the grid. Here comes Mark Basseng, sending one up the inside of Nicky Mayer Melnoff. Can he make it stick? A German versus an Austrian in two German-branded cars. He's trying to hang it on around the outside of four. That'll give him the inside line for five. Great side-by-side -side racing. And Mark Basseng moves up into, well, holds on to seventh place because Mayer Melnoff must have got past him at some point because when they crossed the line, I mean, Basseng was in front. Good Frog strong, forceful move from Mark Bessang. He had the opportunity, he got back and turned five. He took control of that corner. And Nicky Mayo and Mainhoff had little option but just to concede. So here they come then into the left hander at turn eight. And it's a very, very interesting opening few laps. Tony Verlander is gone. Steph Dusseldorf is struggling a little bit with that McLaren. I don't know if it's a confidence issue or if it's the McLaren not working particularly well. Don't forget, Alvaro Parent is currently behind. Uh, is in, where's uh, Michael Bartels? So Michael Bartels has dropped behind the McLarens as well, and the Mercedes. So Michael Bartels has lost a number of positions in that uh, last lap because he crossed the line in fourth place. Now he's well down the field. Out of the final corner comes our race leader. He's already across the line, actually, Tony Verlander. So Alvaro Parent is now putting Oliver Jarvis under pressure for third position. So that's second, third and fourth we're looking at there. And is Parent going to be close enough? Jarvis covers the inside line. It's such a wide track, you can't really cover the inside line unless you're right in the uh, extreme right of the circuit. Parent's got a good run out of that corner. Is He's not going to be close enough to make the move into turn two, I don't think. He thinks about it, actually. It's a pretty quick corner down there at turn two, and Alvaro Parent makes the move stick. Yes, he does. He got into the inside, and he got alongside Oliver Jarvis by such a margin that he got the pass done before he got into the yellow flag zone. So, oh, and he runs it right onto the grass on the exit of the chicane, but he continues, keeps the momentum up, so no way that Oliver Jarvis is going to be able to come back at him down into turn three. So there's the Ford GT climbing the hill down into the hairpin in turn three he comes and these guys are all starting to get stacked up behind Albert von Turnen Taxis who goes a bit wide we go on board with Lawrence Van Thor then currently in 12th position that Ford GT is in front of us in 11th place that's the position we want at the moment through the right hander at turn five which then becomes turn six he's taking a very wide line in compared to the rest yeah, of the cars in front which are all side by side battling I think the, no, the BMW hasn't got past Albert von Turn and Taxis yet. Yeah, but what we're seeing Lauren van Thor do is place his car into a part of the racetrack which will give him the maximum advantage off the corner. No point following in the, no, the wheel tracks of the cars ahead of you because you're never going to be able to do anything and you're going to be running at their pace. So van Thor did get it wrong in the opening lap, now trying to recover and get past the four. Down into turn 10. How Albert von Turner Taxis goes wide again, but every time Turner Taxis goes wide, it gives him a good run out. This is going to be a good run out of this corner, I think, for Lawrence Van Thor because he took a nice wide line in. Thomas Jaeger, I think he passed Sorelli, sorry, behind in that Allen called Mercedes. It's struggling to stay with them. Is the Ford going to fancy a look up into the final corner? He's on the inside line. He's not close enough to make it past Darrell Young yet. But we know the Ford, we saw the Navarra, has got very, very good straight line speed right on the tail of the Lamborghini coming through turn 13 into the last corner, turn 14. And uh, can the Ford get a little slipstream off the Lamborghini down this long straight into turn one? P11. Well, he's in the zone. He's in the zone. The Lamborghini goes defensive. The Ford goes out to the right, gets alongside and under brakes, I think Albert von Turnen Taxis has conceded. No, that's Darrell Young. Albert von Turnen Young. Taxis is in that first Lamborghini. So it's, uh, and actually, Lawrence Van Thor might fancy taking a slice of this action. He's almost close enough to make a move. He's not, though, as they come into turn two. So will Darrell Young be able to fight back? Fastest lap of the race, Alvaro Parent, two minute 4.8. Four tenths of a second quicker than our race leader as they weave through the chicane. Enzo Eid shaking his head, obviously disappointed with Castellacci, who's now running down in 14th place after that off. Yeah, I mean, it was disappointment, but he had a go. He made the move. He just misjudged it. A little bit too quick into the corner on the dirty air part of the racetrack. But you have to take your chances. You make them or you don't. You never move forward. So I think we might see Albert von Turnen Taxis oh. coming in. And this is side by side between the two McLarens. Alvaro Parent has got past Steph Dusseldorf. He was lapping quicker than Dusseldorf. And Parent is now into second place. Pit stop window opens in five seconds. So how soon will Dusseldorf hand over to Makovicki? 
I certainly think on this lap we'll see Von Turn and Taxis come in and hand over to Thomas Enger. I, I think you may well see Oh, he's gone wide, Parent, hasn't he? Down there, that's going to well, allow Kossadorp to come back. It's the cement just a little bit hard in the brakes in that downhill turn 10, but he's recovered it sufficiently, so he's OK. But, of course, the tyres will get a little bit of that, that cement dust, the rubber, whatever else, slick it again. That's the pass. Sweet pass by Alvaro Perez. Then this is where he gets it slightly, and, uh, well... No, this is how he got it. So he sold just a little dummy, really, and put him off but line for the rest of the course. Running wide, fractionally, but he, what he did is he caught the edge of that cement dust rather than running off track. But now Alvaro Perez got ahead of Steph Dusseldorf. I thought maybe they might bring Dusseldorf in at the earliest opportunity to get Makivicki in that car, but the reason that Parent has gotten over it was past the sister car is to try and run down that lead Ferrari of Tony Valando. So they Michael currently got a 4.8 second lead. Michael Bartels has come into the pits to hand over to Yalma Berman, and Thomas Enger will be about to take over from Albert von Turn in taxis as well. So BMW and Lamborghini pits. Right at the start of the pit stop window, side by side, Daryl O'Young and Nicky Mayer mount off, and that's going to allow Vanthor up the inside. So Lawrence Vanthor finally makes that move, stick on the Lamborghini that he's been trying for a long time. We go on board with him now into turn two. Does he fancy a look at Mayer mount off? That's a brave one, but he backs out of it. No, you've got to be alongside the car before you get to the apex, otherwise, you can't make the pass. But uh, just watching them, I mean, the wipers going on the BMW, we're seeing that the rain will appear to have stopped where we are. But certainly around the racetrack, these wipers are going. They've got a problem on the front left there for Thomas Enger. They've dropped him down off the jacks. They've had to put the jacks back up and now attempt to get the front left sorted, which they have. On come the lights. Away goes Thomas Enger. But a bit of a nightmare pit stop, I think, there for the Ryder Engineering Lamborghini squad. Yama Berman, then, is the man to watch. His lap times in the number 18 BMW are going to be the lap times that could bring him into contention for this race. Tony Volanda leads 4.8 seconds clear of Alvaro Parent in second place, who is eight tenths of a second clear of Steph Dusseldorp in third. Out of the pits comes Enzo Eid now in that Ferrari. Well, the first and second place drivers are both lapping at the same time, but the problem is there's a 4.8 second gap between the Ferrari and the McLaren in second place. Steph Dusseldorp, who had been second in the number two McLaren, is now only doing two minutes or seven. Probably more the cause of uh, the overtake by the sister car. That was a bit of a road lap. You normally would expect to be running at the same pace. On board with Lawrence Van Thor. There's our race leader, though. Are either of the McLarens going to pit? Surely the number one McLaren might. Yes, it's it does. Yep. So into the pits comes Steph Dusseldorf. He's going to hand over to Fred Makovicki. We go on board with Lawrence Van Thor trying the outside line into 13 to give himself the best run out. Mayor Manoff may decide to come into the pits this time, though. And they both come in. This will be a fun one. And the Ryder Engineering car of Daryl O. Young. So this will be a great little pit stop battle. Into the pits is the number one car then. Fred McAvicki gets in. Is this um, McLaren going to be able to get started? That's going to be one thing they've struggled with. Well, the car will start. It just takes a little longer yep. for, to get, for the engine to fire up than some of the other competitors in the pit lane. And uh, what they can do is they can anticipate that. And there we see the car down on the off the jack, so no problem with now, and Fred McAvee behind the wheel of that number one car makes his way down the pit lane at 60 kilometers per hour as the Audi guys go to their work for their front line coming off. Yep, so it was BMW, Audi, Lamborghini when the pit stop window began. It's now going to be BMW, very slow pit stop from the Audi squad. Then it's going to be Lamborghini. Are they going to be able to get past? No. So the order is unchanged, but... That's a, a big, a big advantage that Matthias Lauda has made because those three cars came into the pits nose to tail. Yeah, so the two BMWs out, one after the other. The ID follows Stefano Telli, who gave us a bit of a thrill this morning with a big off in the edge of the turn nine. And uh, I mean, there is the leading for uh, Tony Valander. With the, well, we need to see what gap he has between second place because he is the lead car that has yet to make his window. He's got a further just over five minutes and I suspect that Tony Fernando will stay in that car and make use of those five minutes he's the driver who's at speed knows the car, got the tyres working, when he comes in and hands the car over to Philippe Salaquada, he wants to give Salaquada the best advantage he possibly can. He's got 4.6 seconds as they cross the line last time, there you can see the gap visibly and uh, will it have come down at all, it came down on that last lap by a tenth of a second this time around, Alvaro Perent crosses the line and brings it down to 4.1 seconds, so half a second on that last lap was taken out of the lead. 
Jarvis too is lapping quicker than Tony Volander as the Air Force uh, fans watch on in the garage. Then across the line we've got Mark Basseng promoted into fourth place, but of course he hasn't made his pit stop. Then Mike Parisi behind him who also hasn't stopped, neither has Matteo Cressoni, who doesn't have the kind of pace that uh, we thought he might. Lo um, Stefano Telli is now coming under pressure. Another Stefan, spelt differently, but Stefan Racina. And Racina is a bit of an expert at this track, and he's looking up the inside into turn 10, yeah, trying to put uh, Stefan Otelli off. Hasn't worked out just yet. Well, remember, Otelli is on that new set of tyres, just had the pit stop, where the Lamborghini's been out for a lap, and uh, using all the advantage of that, plus the local driver knowledge. Otelli, so experienced, not going to get flustered by the attention of the Lamborghini behind and when he gets to the end of this lap he will probably have that situation in control the last opportunity that will arise for Rosina to get past will be on the exit of turn 13 through 14 if he doesn't get the momentum now then Otelli's going to take control so across the line they come less than half an hour remaining here in this FIA GT1 qualifying race coming to you from Slovakia ring and Rosina is not close enough this time around oh, I say that has a little look to the inside line but he, uh, he's definitely not close enough. This is all allowing Thomas Enger to come in as well. He's in that second Lamborghini you can see behind as they climb the hill over the access tunnel into turn two. Racina shows his nose again into turn two, but all these tricks aren't really going to work on Stefano Telli, 1995 Le Mans, 24-hour winner. But watch what happens on the exit of the chicane. Can Rosina get the Lamborghini in position on acceleration? We'll be, we'll know that we'll be find out a bit later because we go back to the race leader still staying out on track, going on and to start his 12th lap. So this will have to be Tony Verlander's final lap in the car because it's a two-minute lap and the pit stop window closes with 25 minutes remaining. On that last lap, it was only a tenth of a second Alvaro Perenz took out. In comes Mark Basseng. He's going to hand over to Marcus Winkelhock as he rumbles past our little commentary box on the right-hand side there. Mike Parisi has come in as well. So it'll be interesting to see where they come out, actually. They've stayed out a little bit longer. And will they be in this battle for between uh, Ortelli and Rosina? Flapping bomber yeah. on car 25. That's the Rosina car, you can see. Matt Halliday. He's got alongside on the engine of turn, turn nine. nine. Yes, he just got, I don't know what he did, but it's like to see the beginning of that move. But that was a, a local knowledge move from Stefano Rosina. That was a good effort. And now Thomas Engel thinks, well, I like a bit of that action. What have I got to do to make my way past Stefano Rosina? Into the pits comes the Ford GT. Matteo Cressona handing over to Milos Pavlovic. And, uh, well, we saw Ortelli go all kinds of Larry at turn nine in qualifying here's the move up into turn 13 not close enough Thomas Enger but he was uh, looking very very racy out onto the start finish straight you can see the advantage Racina has built up already and this is going to be the battle over well it's still not quite sure what position this is over I'd like to see a bit more of Stefan Rossini in some of these GT1 events that guy can drive a car he certainly can and uh, Thomas Enger can Enger. drive a car as well he's got the inside line into turn one up the inside Jobs are good, and is it? Yeah, yes, and it was it easy. Is. And uh, Stefano Telli knew it. He's going to try and make the switch back because they come out of turn one up the hill. But just the Audi has not got the pace of these two Lamborghini Gallardos, and they didn't get past just by good luck. They got past because fundamentally, in this race, they're the quicker of the two machines. So here now is Matt Halliday. He is just ahead of. Is that Yama Berman on the tyres? It's Matthias Lauda that he is ahead of. So. The pit stops have all taken place now, I believe. Well, apart from our race leader, this is his last chance. So him, he, and Oliver Jarvis, They're and all Alvaro Perez, it's the top three that, that are yet to make Jarvis their stops. Jarvis is in now the pit lane. Yep, so this, is, this could be pretty important. So into the pits they come and the uh, the drills come on and it's uh, going to be very difficult to see how this is going to transpire. It's going to be, can the McLarens hold on? Can they get the car started? It could stop from the McLaren. Where's it going to come out in comparison to the Ferrari? They're telling um, Philippe Salacuada now to go, go, go. And it's going to be the same order. So 
a recovery that time. A <laughs> sigh of relief but, for the Hexes yeah, team. But, but Poor stop for the Audis, actually. Yeah, but the more important one is, is the gap between the Ferrari and the McLaren. Has that reduced from the 3.5 seconds? Look, they just get out. Just to bite, make it up, and that's going to be a McLaren passing a McLaren into turn one. Makovicki up the inside, moves up into second position, then he goes past, and so it's, um, well, that's going to be interesting, little battle now between, well, Gregoire no, no. de Moustier, It is, of it is yeah. going to be a battle. Fred Makovicki has got a mission. His mission statement is going to be, I am going to catch the Ferrari with Philippe Silacuada in it, and I'm going to pass that Ferrari. And Gregoire de Moussier, now under pressure from the BMW behind, and now that is Yelma Berman, he's about to be potentially overtaken as Berman looks to go down one way, then up the inside into turn three. Oh, very, very close. Berman oh, looking He's racing. got it, no, he's got it. Yeah. He, he got the momentum. De Moussier ran wide in the middle part of that long turn three, and the BMW didn't need another invitation. Yep, it looked as though sending it up the inside forced De Moussier into a mistake. So now we've got Ferrari, McLaren, BMW in the top three. And through the right hander they come. And look how quickly Berman has built up over per, um, Gregoire de Moussier. Yeah, so de Moussier just trying to get to grips with the tyres, get to grips with the car, whereas Berman has been out for a couple of laps. Mayor Mounhoff saying, come on, Yama, you can do it. And there is our race leader then. The Philippe gap Salacuada. has clearly closed on it. Certainly, yeah. probably about two and a half seconds. And by the end of this lap, as they come across the line, Salacuada ran wide, coming through turn 11. Didn't need to be doing that. Get that Ferrari onto the dirtier line on that cement dust. As we ride on board, Fred Makovic up over the top of the hill. The drop down from turn 12 all the way down to 13. And the other oh, Ferrari... Oh, goes Enzo Eid. So that's the second time that Ferrari's been in the gravel trap. He keeps it out just... That was good work from Enzo. Well, Just kept enough momentum to get onto the grass again. We saw the look of disgust in Enzo each face when his <laughs> teammate went off Castellacci. Now we have Whiskey Castellacci there. As we see the 32 car of Hotelli looking now to fight back. Now that he might have got some temperature, getting up alongside the 17 car of Matthias Lauda makes the pass. Yep, good job from Hotelli. He moves up into, where does that take him? Tenth position, eight. I think. Uh, Yep, into eighth position, in fact, you're right. So, out onto the start, finish straight, they come. Philippe Salacuada leads. He has a gap of only 1.1 seconds over Fred Makovicki. They were both quicker than Yelma Berman on that uh, last lap. Well, I don't know about Salacuada because he came out of the pits, didn't he? So his last lap time isn't really um, eligible. But you can see how close the gap is coming down. Ferrari leads, McLaren second. Fantastic stuff here in FIA GT1 really is a battle of the brands and we are seeing two of the most iconic brands in motorsport indeed and, and this is what i've been waiting to see two fantastic road cars one made in the traditional ferrari style out of metal the other made in the traditional mclaren style made out of carbon fiber through the left hander at turn eight now into the kind of longer right hander at uh, turn nine which will then take them up the hill and how quickly, where is the McLaren going to be strong? That's going to be a key part of this battle as well. Because if... Uh, it's, I think it's not a matter of where the McLaren's strong, I think it's a matter of the strength of the respective two drivers. And you have to think that Fred Makovicki is going to be the stronger of the two drivers. And bear in mind, we know the pace of the McLaren, we saw that on Navarra. We know the potential of the Ferrari, we've had yet to see that being materialised. So you would expect that Makovicki is going to take a move between now and 21 minutes of the race remaining. But Salacuada has consolidated. He's keeping the McLaren at bay at some part. They're coming through turn 13. Watch the Ferrari, the tail of the Ferrari. It seems consistent, but rain again falling in the windscreen as they come out of turn 13 through into 14. Yep, so it's going to be about who has the confidence in the car across the line they come. The gap is just four tenths of a second. So on that last lap, seven tenths of a second was the gap that it came down by. Philippe Salacuada is no mean peddler himself. A man from Prague in the Czech Republic. has had a couple of Formula Renault 3.5 pole positions in his time. He's done German Formula 3, A1 GP as well. Fred Makovicki is right on his tail and looks as though, well, there you can see the comparison, looks as though he has the pace at the moment. But will he be able to find a place to make the move? Because the, oh, the McLaren lots quicker through that little kink. Yeah, but remember, you've got a, a, a normally aspirated 
3.5 liter V8 Ferrari engine as against a 3. I think it's 6 liter turbocharged V8 engine in the McLaren. So quite different engine power packs, but producing very similar performances on the racetrack. Here comes the battle, Ferrari versus McLaren for the lead of the race. Less than 20 minutes to go here at the Slovakia ring. And Philippe Salaquada is struggling to get that Ferrari into the apexes. You can see apices, I think it is technically. You can see that he's having to turn in a lot earlier. And Makovic is able to take wider lines in, more speed through the corner, and better runs out. Yeah, but one of the areas that the McLaren we saw in, uh, again, Navarra in the, in the championship race, that when it gets tucked under the rear of another car, it does lose downforce. And that's the strength that the Ferrari's got. It's running in clear air, it's generating all its downforce. The McLaren is having to maybe make slight compromises to find areas on the racetrack where he can get a breath of on you know, sunny air from the Ferrari to try and give that front end of the McLaren the bike that it needs to get into the corner. It is a quicker car overall in a lap, and if it can't get itself into that position, that's where Makovic is going to have to work very hard. Into the final corner, wipers still going because the rain is coming down marginally harder now, I would say. Ferrari takes a different line through the final corner, but Makovic is going to be right under the gearbox of that car as they come across the line. The gap was four tenths of a second, it's now three tenths of a second. You can see Makovic pulling out. How is uh, Yama Berman behind? Was seven tenths of a second quicker than both? Pulling off is the number two car. That is Gregoire de Moustier. It is looks a, mechanical. Is it a pull off or did he get caught in the rain? Is again beginning to fall and it just might be around the racetrack that he caught it at the wrong part. You need to know whether that was a mechanical or a driver error. Into the right hander at turn two they come. And this is really, really challenging conditions for Philippe Salaquada and well for the whole team. But oh, that is a, that's yeah. more than likely a let's say a non-driver issue. Yeah, yeah. I'll go no further because you know teams are like super sensitive to make a comment on something we can't consolidate. Well, it certainly wasn't something the driver did. No, he's pulled up next to the uh, the fire extinguishers down there on the infield. So. Good work from Gregoire de Moustier to find a, a good place to park it. Here's the battle for the lead, though, continuing. Salaquada ahead of Makovicki. They are right together as they come through the long sequence of right-handers at turn six, then into the kink at seven. Ooh, an oversteer and eight. for the Ferrari. Salaquada got caught out, and it allows Makovicki to have another look, but he wasn't close enough to take advantage of it. But the back end of the Ferrari did just a fraction of a snap, and that was a bit of opposite log. Up the hill they come. You can see the rain visibly on the on the uh, on the camera now. Let's hear from Tony Belanda. His teammate Philippe Salaquada is leading this race. He's down in the pits with Haley. Tony, um, how is Philippe going to keep hold on to that position, not let Fred steal it? To be honest, I went to the team hospitality. I was too afraid to see it. Now the the conditions are quite tricky. It was raining a little bit when I was driving, but now it's raining a bit more. So hopefully we get a decent finish and good starting place for tomorrow. Are you ready for the wet? Yeah, I mean, it, it should be okay as long as it's not like in between. I mean, either wet or dry, so it should be okay for us. Thank you. So the gap between our first and second places look like it's expanded. It's up to nine tenths of a second. Yama Berman is getting involved as well. Their sister BMW is having uh, some fun all by himself. Matthias Lauda battling with Thomas Jaeger over 11th position. Jaeger in the Mercedes is going to you right up behind Louder into the final corner. Not close enough to make the move. Oh, he sends a late one up the inside. Thomas Jaeger, great stuff. Sweet as a nut, Thomas. That was a great move. You, you, you sort of got Mateus on the move one way, and uh, you're still on the dummy now, Mateus, just for the wheel. Oh, arc. there's going to be no. contact coming through turn 14. Yeah, just about Jaeger holds it. Uh, well, you know, Jaeger had the advantage, and Mateus Louder stuck the nose of the BMW. He's got good straight line advantage. Trying to get back at the Mercedes Benz, but uh, Thomas Jaeger hard on the brakes into turn one. The rain still falling, the track is beginning to get more and more slick, and the slightly more nimble BMW may have the advantage swing back to its favour as Jaeger goes to block into turn two. Cuts back again, but Lada tries to dive up the inside. Oh. They're going for it, aren't they? These two battling hard through the... Remember, that's meant to be a yellow flag zone. No, the yellow flag starts yeah, after on, turn okay. two, so uh, just before, about 100 well, metres was, before this game, but it was certainly it was, touch and go. I was the, be, uh, if I was the race director, I'd be just, just check that one and make sure he wasn't maybe a little bit forgetful about the flag. So, through the right-hander at turn three, down there at the far end of the circuit. 
how is the battle for the lead progressing? We'll check up on that in a minute because it looks as though Thomas Jaeger has just about managed to uh, pull out this gap now over Lauda. Matt Halliday has just set a very fast first sector time. Here's the lead battle, and the the Ferrari has managed to get himself sorted a little bit. Yelma Berman is the man on the move in the last 15 minutes of this race. Ferrari leads, McLaren second, BMW third, all of them within one camera shot after 45 minutes of racing. And the rain is falling heavily, yeah. and that's going to be another lap, and somebody's going to make the move into the pitch. You can see how heavy it is down at turn 13 and 14. Whereas the Ferrari did it? No, it didn't. It stayed out. But these conditions are going to deteriorate if the rain continues at the rate it's doing. And uh, I don't know which of the three of these cars we've got on camera will make the brave move. To think it's only going to get out worse. I mean, how do you know? You're just sitting there driving the car, you're relying on the team to give you the advice of what's happening from their perspective. The lap time drop, who's going quicker? Right now, it looks like the Elmer Berman, to me, is the driver who's going to make that place a second place rather than the third. Makovicki is struggling big time. That last lap was a two, mi uh, sorry, a two minute 6.1. Yama Berman did a two minute 4.7. So one Point four seconds quicker was Yelma Berman on that last lap around. The Once rain's the really coming down. Over the crest they come, down into turn three. There's our race leader, Melanda, uh, sorry, Salaquada. But Yelma Berman is right up behind in this battle for second place. He was, I mean, I'm sure Berman thought I've got a pop into turn three. Unfortunately, he wasn't close enough. As uh, we look at the, the scale of the view of the McLaren, and it's, uh, it is struggling, it's falling away gradually from the lead of Philippe Salaquada in the Ferrari. There, the rain, you can see how heavy it is. Now Berman looks in turn 13, and will the McLaren go into the pit? Well, this, uh, is up, this is a little bit early on in the track, isn't it? Because this is, and there's the inside, turn into turn eight, gets the move done. McLaren gets the cut back, though, on the exit. Berman can't keep it all together. Now they come into turn nine. This battling is going to play perfectly into the hands of the Ferrari of Philippe Salaquada up in front. He's got to be inside into turn nine. Makovicki really struggling in these damp conditions. If anyone's going to take the gamble and come in, it's got to be the Hexus McLaren because it looks the most uncomfortable at the moment. Well, at the minute, I wouldn't because as long as you can see your car, the second place car just taking that away from the McLaren and the Ferrari. Off goes Ortelli. Ortelli's got caught out as well. But the, what you would lose by coming in at this point when your two principal competitors are staying on track, that's what you've got to lay up. You, I mean, to bring McAvicki in now, put him on wet tyres, at this point, it's, a, it's the worst decision that either the driver or the team manager is going to have to make. So, Philippe Salaguada stays out another lap. Look at them trying to hold on the car through turn 13. They all stay out, the top three. Fourth place, then, is Frank Stippler, or is it? Because Marcus Winkelhock is right up with him. So, once again, the Mercedes have a terrible qualifying, terrible free practice, but come the race, they're all of a sudden in the battle. So this is the fourth place strap across the line. Frank Stippler ahead at the moment in the Audi. Behind him is Marcus Winkelhock in the Mercedes. Is he going to be close enough into turn one? No, he's not. Stippler holds the line. Then yeah. the two Lamborghinis in sixth and seventh. Yeah, but it's the cutback that Stippler will have to defend because he's going to have the Mercedes all over him on the exit of the corner and the Mercedes now on the inside as they make the climb up the hill towards turn two and can he get to their momentum is the Audi going to have to break fractionally sooner and the Mercedes gets the position now that was good clean driving by both drivers they realised that two into one doesn't go the Mercedes had the pace and uh, job done team manager of car 37 has to go to the race director after the race so that's uh, Thomas Jaeger and across the hill they come so that means that Philippe Salaquada leads in the Ferrari second place is the BMW of Yama Berman Fred McAvicki third in the McLaren fourth is now that Mercedes of Marcus Winkelhock and fifth is that Audi of Frank Stippler with Racina and Enger in sixth and seventh in their Lamborghinis Halliday ninth Pavlovich tenth and uh, sorry Halliday eighth Pavlovich ninth Ortelli tenth amazingly the lead Ferrari lap two and a half seconds quicker then the second and third place cars, that's the BMW of Yolma Berman, and then further back, a further two seconds back, was that of Makovicki and the McLaren. Ferrari, I don't know where they're finding the grip. Salaquada doing a stunning job yeah. in really tricky conditions, pulling away literally by, almost by the corner of the 14 corners on the lap. So, also, it's worth keeping an eye out. Stefan Rossina and Thomas Enger are lapping five seconds a lap quicker than the fourth and fifth place men, Stippler and Winkelhock, and they're only eight seconds behind. Hexis ready with the wet tyres. Ten minutes to go here at the Slovakia ring. This really is a game of 
it's Russian roulette, isn't it? It's just who dares stay out the longest. Well, he's going to stay out. Philippe Zalaquada, they had a 4.4 second advantage when they came across the line the last lap. It's going to be the best part of almost double that on the BMW in second place and a further almost four and a bit seconds back is the McLaren. So then here we've got fourth and fifth places. There you can see fourth Mercedes, fifth Audi, and then here come the Lamborghinis. They're on it. Stefan Rosina is flying around this uh, circuit. It looked as though Matt Halliday was challenging Thomas Enger behind, actually, as well, in the battle. No, Enger has now got past Rosina, and there is Rosina. He's spun, I presume, on the... Oh, I saw Matt Halliday one. looking up the inside. That's at turn four, 13, actually, no, no, just in front of the pit lane, lane yes. entrance. He's got the engine going again. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a bit well, of... a rear tire. Yeah, rear left, rear, rear left puncture. There's been a problem. Some of the flints, this, what they call the gravel trap, clearly, and that's what caused it, was not a driver error. The rear tire has been... Basically, it's shredded, so he's come, fortunately, it happened at the pit lane entry not too far to go. As we see the wet tires Hotel. going on to Otelli's car and uh, back to this 24 car, the Thomas Enger car. It's putting pressure now on Idy. Yeah. Frank Stippler. Thomas Enger was six seconds quicker than Frank Stippler on that last lap. Incredible stuff from the uh, Czech driver. And it won't be long before he cruises past Stippler. Yeah, into the right-hander at five they come. And there's the move. Yeah, he's easy. Enough. But the sister car, not a lot of action in the pit lane. They're all standing around looking at it. Oh, look at the tyre. When are they going to get that car onto wet or not? Botelli is on wet. He's going to leave the pit lane. We will find out if there's any major benefit on the wet weather tyre over the slick that we're seeing presently. The majority of the field running on. The last lap of the race leader, Philippe Salalacuada, was a 2.16.9. When this car finishes its first out lap and goes on to its first flying lap on wet weather tyres, if it isn't at least, well, the best part of 10, well, 8 seconds to 10 seconds a lap quicker, then it's probably been a wasted trip. Yeah, don't forget, Otelli had been off, so there was probably nothing to lose for him and no, the team to, to but do the, it. But for everybody else to yes, observe, absolutely. and uh, the most important thing is not for maybe Otelli, but for this, the sister idea of Frank Stippler, currently in fifth place, involved in that battle uh, with Thomas Enger, defending that fifth place from Thomas Enger. OK, so across the line, with a 2 minute 18.3 comes Philippe Salaquada. He is driving very impressively, it has to be said. Second place then is Yelma Berman. Across the line comes he. And then in third place we've got Fred Makovicki. And there is a, a little bit of an off somewhere for Matthias Lauda. Plenty of grass in the grill. Yeah, well, that's going to be a stop because that will just simply leave the engine temperature, oil temperature going off the clock. We've only got seven in a minute, seven um, minutes, 20 seconds. He could, be, he, could be, he could maybe baby it. Makovicki might not even get a podium here because the car behind was five seconds a lap quicker. That was Marcus Wickelhock. Thomas Enger was seven seconds quicker on that last lap than Fred Makovicki in the McLaren. Yeah, I mean, Makovicki's lap was two minutes 23. Yeah. And Winkelhock and the Mercedes behind was two minutes 18. I mean, where do you find that or lose that amount of time? I don't know, but... Well, there they are. I mean, they're all over each other. The Enger now behind the Mercedes going down goes. the inside into turn three. Late on the brakes for Thomas Enger. Can he get the move done? He can. And he's going to be up in a third position before too long. This is an absolutely barnstorming drive from Thomas Enger. Opposite lock all the way. Fantastic stuff to watch as we stay on board with him. It's not going to be long before we get this onboard pass of um, Fred Makovicki and to move him up into third position. Here we go then. Where's it going to be? Surely he's not going to just drive around the outside of him. You can see how much Makovicki is twitching. He just drives around the outside. No, Makovicki holds on for the time being. Huge spit of flame from the rear end of that McLaren as they come into the tight left-hander, up the inside, drive past into turn eight. Makovicki's got no response. He's not able to do anything. Whatever the car setup is, or whether it's a loss of tyre temperature, not a loss of the Mercedes goes through as well, so Makovicki has lost two places in the space of three corners. Yeah, so... Tom, and Thomas Enger came in, and they pitted him very, very early in this race, so there's no question. He is on slick tyres, but he hasn't moved on to the wet. Just over four, five and three quarters. <laughs> oh, hey, Albert. Albert, who's studying in Rome, I think it's a psychology course, that will, you know... Motor racing may be about psychology, but it's about just good, honest, seat of the pants, racing driver, nows. And that's what Thomas Enger's got. Yeah. So, into... 
turn 13 they come and uh, there's Matt Halliday and he's managed to work his way up into seventh place race leader across the line Philippe Salaquada storming drive from him Berman in second place third place now then is Thomas Enger his last lap was three seconds quicker than Berman I think it's going to be a tough ask for Enger to do any more than third place but don't forget they had an awful pit stop as well that front left they had to drop it down off the jacks put it back on the jacks then adjust the wheel nut this has been a storming drive from Thomas Enger great drive from Salaquada as well the McLaren has been the surprise it looked like it was in the bag but these mixed conditions through goes the Audi as well Frank uh, Stippler up the inside it's, it's just simply that the McLaren cannot generate enough temperature in the tyre to make it work in difficult conditions consequently in the Porsche and I would like to make that position another loss to the McLaren simply there's no grip and uh, other cars around it which are putting more energy into the tyres Vicky goes very defensive coming into turn three but Matt Halliday will get the option up the inside on the exit can he get the Porsche alongside the McLaren he needs to be careful doesn't want to make contact because he doesn't want to lose that position through a little bit of oh and the McLaren still holds on but Vicky doesn't like the thought of the Porsche all that old technology challenging the latest and greatest auto -hooking. On board we go then with Matt Halliday. Wide line into the right-hander of five. He's going to oh, almost touch the back there of the McLaren through the left-hand kink. And surely that will be job done into turn eight. Looks like it. He's got the inside line now. And Matt Halliday moves up into sixth position, which I think they'll be pleased with after starting at the back of the grid. And Porsche clear as well, so that's Matt Halliday. One more for him. And uh, well, he's going to put Halliday in. Sixth. sixth and Becky Vicky will be down in seventh. Correct. And uh, Milos Pavlovic in eighth, Thomas Jaeger in ninth, Matthias Lauda is in tenth position. Stefano Telly uh, on his wet weather tyres is doing two minute 15.1, whereas Philippe Salaquada is doing two minute 18. So it's only two or three seconds quicker. Well, Thomas Enger is doing 216 and a half. Yeah, exactly, on, so on slicks. Slick, so that was the judgment you had to make. Uh, is it worth coming in? unless you can pick up a huge amount of time per lap the time that you lose coming into the pit lane offset with the time that you're not picking up on the loose wet weather tires because the racetrack while it is now wet it isn't the kind of depth of rain or water that the wet weather tire likes and it needs to use penultimate lap of the race ferrari from bmw but the bmw was four seconds slower than thomas enger on that last lap there's about 4.7 seconds between them with two laps remaining. It's this could be on for third position. For could second be on for position. second position even as well. There's the BMW winding its way through the chicane. Here comes Thomas Enger, absolutely in the zone. He is all credit to Thomas Enger. He has given us some incredible well, drives already this season. This is a, a typical virtuoso performance from Thomas Enger. A great, great driver who has just found the right combination of what he's got within the Lamborghini, the way he can use the car, and you know, such an experienced driver. Look on board in these greasy conditions, it's so smooth. We've seen the other cars switching around, bags of opposite lock. Enger just knows where the grip is. It, that's an intuitive driver. It's incredible. Everything, his body, his feet, his hands, are sensing the information coming through the pedals, the steering wheel, the seat of the car. Matt Halliday is having a bit of fun. He might grab a fifth position before too long to try and get past Frank Stippler. We go on board with the Porsche. Fantastic when these onboards bring us right into the action. And the sound on the Porsche is fantastic as well. Nice wide line in for Halliday into eight. Then the little short squirt up towards nine. And where is he going to be able to make it through? This is where that Porsche ended up in the Armco barrier in the hands of Mike Parisi in qualifying. You can see the rain still coming down. It's just been, it's been, it hasn't been heavy rain as we've seen in other circuits this year, but it's certainly been enough to spice up the racing and add a little bit of grease to the circuit. Surely, no traction out of this corner, he's going to get a bit of an advantage. He's going to get it done into turn 13. So it looked like the leader comes across the line for the. Now watch the Matt Halliday. He's going to go one way. The idea will go defensive. He's going to go the other way. Can he get alongside before they that. get into break? Well, just simply. Well, I was going to say simply part of the way, but Frank Stippler done a very good job keeping the Audi in contention and denying Matt Halliday that position, oh, but he has to give it up eventually. And there's the, the battle, battle for, for second. second. <laughs> and 
it's going to be Thomas Enger around the outside, but he's not, going to get no, the cut yet. back into turn one. We go on board with him. He tries to be boxed out by Yama Berman, but he's got the inside line. Thomas Enger into turn two, moves up into second position. This is a phenomenal drive from Thomas Enger. The writer engineering squad cannot believe how strongly Enger has performed. That last lap was a two minute 14.3 quicker than Stefano Telli on the wet tyres and Enger has been the star of this race well one of the stars Philippe Salaquada you've got to give him credit he pulled away from those faster cars make, make no mistake Philippe Salaquada has done a really great job for Ferrari AF Corsa but obviously because of the drive through the field because of the problem during the pit stop Thomas Enger is probably going to be the, the drive that most people will remember yeah this has been a fantastic performance from a number of drivers out there AF Corsa have waited a long time to get this win in GT1. It's been a difficult opening three rounds for them, but it looks as though Philippe Salaquada is going to pick up only his second podium of the season, but he and Tony Valanda don't a curse fate. There's still a reasonable amount of distance to go, but it's looking good for them as they come down the hill into the left-hander at turn 10, and Salaquada has performed very, very strongly, just taking it easy. He's got an 8.6 second advantage I mean, he, he over really, Thomas Enger. He did slow it down as he yeah. came down the I hill. I a bit worried for a moment. Well, I, mean, I wondered if there was a problem. So, into the right-hander, the final turn, 13. And it's going to be Philippe Salaquada. Look at Thomas Enger, he's nearly going to win this. But into the final corner comes Philippe Salaquada. Tony Valanda took the start, took the lead, let us not forget, with some brilliant around the outside overtaking, extended the lead. Philippe Salaquada took over, avoided all the troubles, avoided all the slippery conditions, and AF Corsa win in GT1. Ferrari win. Second for Lamborghini, Thomas Enger. There's his girlfriend cheering out of the pit window. Absolutely fantastic. Fantastic drive from him. Third place is going to be Yama Berman. Top job, couldn't cope with the other two on the slick tyres. No, the two drivers that really seem to work well were Salaquado, the winning Ferrari, Thomas Enger, the second And off base. goes the 33 Frank car. Stippler. Frank Stippler from sixth position has lost out. That means Winkelhock finishes in fourth, uh, Matt Halliday in fifth. Who's going to be sixth? Will it be Frank Stippler? Will he be able to recover in time? Yes. Yes, he does, just about. Ahead of Milos Pavlovich, and look at Fred Makovicki all the way down there in eighth position, I, mean, I think he's going to finish. You, you, you'd imagine that Frank Akibiki is driving on a racetrack that is a skating... Well, he's, no, oh, he's, got, a he's got a problem. Yeah. There is a problem with the McCann. May, maybe. Maybe, that's been, maybe that's been a factor that we've not been aware of. We've been suggesting that it might be just he's not got tyre temperature in these difficult conditions, and uh, that car is just coming across the start-finish line that little more than a pace, and uh, there is no power behind that car at all. It is just the momentum that it has coming off turn 13 and 14, gets across the start finish line, so he's finished, he's classified, but all the way down in ninth place. Tenth position goes the way of Matthias Lauda after that. Second BMW had a bit of a fun race. Stefano Telly across the line in 11th position, and 12th position for Enzo Eid after that. Of course, the Ferrari had two trips in the gravel, so a tale of two cars for Ferrari today. And... Uh, the race director send out a message to the teams. Thank you to all the teams and drivers for their behaviour in the chicane in these difficult conditions. That's nice to nice to see. Yes, of course, that, uh, the, the chicane was a hot topic, but actually, it's become a bit of a non-event, which is which is good. Well, I think the fact that it's a non-event is, is obviously it's great, but the, the, the chicane in itself did work. It did what it was designed to do. That was to slow the cars down, going over the crest of that bridge. And uh, there was concern that if they hadn't put it there, the cars would have been getting airborne in a not a particularly productive way. So it was put in, it wasn't a popular move, but the execution has, I think, worked extremely well. Absolutely. So, Philippe Salaquada wins for AF Corsa. He and Tony Volander will be on the top step of the podium and on pole position for tomorrow's race here at the Slovakia Ring, the championship race. You, uh, you only pick up eight points for winning the qualifying race. Still, a decent help towards your tally but it, uh, it's really the pole position for the championship race that means everything. Salaquada will start that championship race tomorrow. Thomas Enger will start the championship race alongside him. And Michael Bartel, Yama Berman, sorry, will start on third place. So into the pits comes Philippe Salaquada. And, well, as we had a 
delayed race start by 15 minutes. We're going to extend our coverage here in the Slovakia ring by 15 minutes. So we will be bringing you all the post-race reaction from the drivers, all the podium ceremonies as these Slovakians prepare to go home and then hopefully come back for tomorrow's championship race. Interesting little statistic that the first two cars were driven by Czech drivers and we are in the Slovakian Republic. This was at one point a unified country. They then separated. So you've got the Czech Republic, Slovakian Republic, and there's two Czech drivers that are on the front two, or top two positions on the podium. And the Slovakian driver spun and finished down in 13th and place. And he could so have been on the podium. He could have been. He certainly had the pace. But there's Philippe Salaguada. Him and Tony Valanda absolutely delighted with that. And, and I tell you also, there will be delight at Ferrari AF yeah. Corsa. And for all the Ferrari fans around the world that have been waiting to see their cherished brand take a victory in GT1. Yeah. They've certainly had the pace this year. That hasn't been uh, up for doubt. There is possibly the man of the race. I'm tentative to give it to him because Philippe Salacuada did a stunning job. But Thomas Enger's drive was something else. Well, where he found yeah. that grip on the slick tyres. I think, I think it, it is often the case in a driver chasing, it is often easier for the driver to chase than the driver leading, yeah. who is having to decide whether to make a pit stop or what do I do, team? Do I stay out? Do I keep going? Are my lap times comparable to the competition? Is, am I going to be run down? Thomas Enger, hugely experienced driver, and Philippe Salacuada did an outstanding job to take that 54 air course of Ferrari. So there he is congratulating his team. And uh, there is Thomas Enger. They shake his hands. And there's Hayley Coxon rounding up all the drivers to have a quick word with them in a few moments' time. Uh, Enger and Von Turn and Taxis will start second on the grid. So it'll be five, six, seven brands in the top seven positions in the end. We can't say that uh, it's not providing some close, interesting and diverse racing, GT1. It's been an absolutely fantastic well, season Well, you know, so you have far. to say thank you, nature. Because undoubtedly, undoubtedly, that little bit of rain spiced up the outcome of the race. I don't think Thomas Enger would have finished in second place. Albert, we should be bowing to you, not you bowing to the commoners. <laughs> Thomas Enger, absolutely delighted. Congratulated by hands there. The engineer and then congratulated by his girlfriend. Let's hear from Philippe Salacuada and Tony Volander, AF Corsa Ferrari, their first win in FIA GT1. Philippe, congratulations on your first win for the team. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank you, uh, Tony, and all the team, all the sponsors, all the people which are here. Uh, it was a great job. Uh, it was a great start from Tony, which he made from fourth to fifth, for fourth to first place. He made a gap for me. And then I has to. Then uh, in the race was a bit tricky because starts to rain for me, and uh, I had to. I had to be very careful because the McLaren was very close, but we had a good pace, and then we bring it home at, to first position on first position. But Tony starting on the front row tomorrow. Can you do it again? Yeah, hopefully yes. Uh, I mean today was an exciting day. To be honest, I didn't expect uh, us to win. I mean we had more pace than the previous race in Navarra, but I'm really happy for team for Philip and. Uh, I think uh, this is a big moral boost for the whole team and uh, we keep working and to have a good uh, race tomorrow and the uh, coming races. Do you think you'll be as strong in the dry tomorrow? Uh, I cannot tell you. I mean, especially in the beginning, I think we can push, but then we need to see how much drop the others have compared to our, our drop shot. Thank, Thank you, guys. I presume the drop, he's probably referring to the tyres yeah, and mean, how quickly they drop off. Yes, exactly. Once the tyre performance starts to, to drop away, Will they lose more in relation to other competitors around them? But today it worked in their favour. They didn't have the drop off. In fact, they were able to find grip in the very difficult damp going into wet conditions, which we did have in the end. It was almost sufficiently wet for spray to be coming from the rear wheels and tyres. As Thomas Enger and Albert from Turner Taxis congratulate the Ferrari AF team. Let's hear from Albert von Turner and Taxis and Thomas Enger. You can see them there, they're with Hayley Coxon. Congratulations, Thomas. That was a stunning effort. Where did you find the grip? Uh, in, in this beautiful white Lamborghini. Um, obviously, when the car is good, I'm able to drive fast. So uh, the car was perfect. It couldn't be better. I needed two more laps to get into P1. Unfortunately, the, lap, uh, the race was a bit short, but uh, it was all perfect. To have the problem in the pit stop and come to second place at the end, it's fantastic. Fantastic job of everybody from Royal Lamborghini. 
Huge celebrations in the team, Albert. Yeah, we are speechless. I mean, what Thomas did out there, everyone who saw it was just absolutely speechless. And I think, yeah, we've proven once again that Thomas is the strongest driver. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Happy man, isn't he? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean to have that partnership, Thomas Enger and Albert von Turner Taxis, I did mention that there was some consideration uh, that Stefan Rosina should share with Thomas, because that would be a more balanced driver pairing. It would be a pairing that would probably give a better chance for number 24 Lamborghini to win. Nevertheless, they opted to do what they've done. They got a second place. Let's hear from our third place men, Yama Berman, Michael Bartels. Yama, such a strong finish, but do you think the weather conditions went to your disadvantage? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, on one side it was, um, you know, easier to uh, get past the McLarens, but on the other side, uh, these guys were very quick in these conditions. So uh, I think uh, in the end it uh, didn't make a big difference one way or the other, you know. But uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I was pretty sure we were we would finish in P2, and then two laps from the end. Uh, my engineer was on the radio, Anger is coming and he's closing in very quickly. I was looking in my mirror, I thought you must be closing very quickly if he wants to catch me in one or two laps. But he was even quicker than that because he caught me in one lap. So, uh, and then uh, once he passed me in the first corner, for some reason it was really strange. And, but uh, in the second corner, or between the second and the third corner, uh, the power steering broke on the car. So the last lap I had to do without power steering, which was a bit tricky. But better now than tomorrow in the race or earlier in the race already different so. planet today different planet which tires you drove Pirelli black <laughs> black crown Pirelli thank you guys Italian car Lamborghini oh. <laughs> so Thomas Enger absolutely delighted and everyone yeah. impressed I know there are everybody in the podium are very happy and I mean Michael Bartels alluding to planet Enger <laughs> he's on a different planet for everybody else but you know, that's what Thomas Enger has got the capacity to do. He is a really outstanding driver, single-seaters, GT, whatever. Here's a look at the results. Four and a half seconds was only the gap between Salaquada and Enger at the end of that race. Yama Berman and Michael Bartels coming home in third place. Then we had the Mercedes of Marcus Winkelhock and Mark Basseng. Matt Halliday and Mike Parisi, quiet-ish race, plenty going on. We saw plenty of them, but never really followed their progress properly came home in fifth position very impressive from them uh, Racina and Darlow Young in 13th unfortunately retiring as did De Moustier and Alvaro Parent Andres Zuba and Benjamin Rich unable to take the start of the race due to their problems so well an action-packed race and plenty going on mainly helped out by the weather towards the end let's have a little look back so it was a safety car start after oil had been dropped all over the circuit here at Slovakia Ring for the qualifying race ahead of FIA GT1's main championship race tomorrow. There you can see the number eight car was the culprit of the oil spilling, Andreas Zuba. And uh, the brollies went up fairly early on. It was only light drizzle for the start of the race once the safety car came in. This was where the AF Corsa won the weight race, really. Absolutely incredible move from Belanda. Moved up into second place, forced their way through into the lead by the end of the first lap. Yeah, I mean, the Ferrari, whether it was Belanda or Salaquada, it just looked destined as the sister car, and Castellacci goes gravel digging away way out around the back of the track. But the Ferrari had pace. McLaren came in, De Moussier got out, and uh, put, uh, Parent got out, put De Moussier in. That's the Makaviki car, Fred Makaviki taking over. And uh, but 25, that is a problem. There's the Lamborghini that really had us all on the edge of our seats, wondering would it make it onto the podium, then wondering would it make it onto second place of the podium. Yeah, absolutely fantastic stuff from them. Fred Makovicki came out and immediately overtook the sister McLaren up the inside into turn one of Gregoire de Moussier. And at this point, it looked as though it was McLaren's for the taking. Fred Makovicki was absolutely flying through the field as de Moussier held up Yelma Berman behind. Berman finally made the move stick on the right hander into turn four. Enzo E decided to take the number four Ferrari for a little bit of a visit to the beach. But at this point, as I say, it looked as though it was all there for McLaren's taking, quicker than the Ferrari. The other McLaren retired, but it was just a case of when would the McLaren pass, then the heavens opened. Exactly, well, they opened in a gentle way, but it was beguiling. There you can see how much rain was falling towards the back end of the race. It got to maybe a lot heavier than it was initially. And uh, simply Thomas Enger on board in the Lamborghini, coming up behind one of the Audis, that would probably be the Stippler car. No problem whatsoever for the Czech Republic driver, just had the pace. He says it's down to this Lamborghini, it's a beautiful car. 
it gave me the best ride of the day. And this was looking back from the 38 car of Marcus Winkelhock, and he made it through past him. Then he just had to deal with the McLaren. We thought he was far too far behind the... Uh, everyone thought he was far too far behind the second place BMW, but it turned out he was not. He caught, got up the inside into turn one, and passed, moved into second place. But let's take nothing away from Philippe Salacuada. He and AF Corsa take the win. Join us tomorrow for the championship race when they will be on pole position. See you then.